The following presentation was recorded at the Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, please visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors for helping make these videos possible. Um, so we can go ahead and get started if you guys are good with that. So my name is Mary Cox and I work for Red Hat. So hopefully, since you expect, hopefully you're familiar a little bit with Red Hat. Um, and I work on the middleware side, kind of the opposite side of the operating system. Um, so I've been there for three years. And today I'll be talking about lessons learned from using IoT devices in industry. So a little bit about my experience and where these lessons are coming from. I was on a long-term engagement, so I'm a consultant, so I work with various clients. One of my clients was putting together a pretty much a revamp of a public transit system. So the company had mostly been focused on the hardware. The fare boxes where you tap your pass to get on the bus or train, as well as the turnstiles you walk through and then also the point of sale systems. So our goal was to get them more into the software side of things and also update those devices. So in turn, a lot of those devices, the fare boxes, the point of sales, ended up being modeled as those Internet of Things. So what is Internet of Things? So we're going to go over a little bit of what that is, what the use case is, then I'll jump into the lessons, which will be the bulk of the presentation a little conclusion, and then there should be some time for questions. So the IoT use case. So the other day I was watching Silicon Valley, so a little spoiler alert for anyone who watches that. So um, Jim Yang got a smart fridge. So that's a classic example of Internet of Things, taking an appliance and making it connected to some sort of larger system, and you can leverage the data to improve the efficiency efficiency. So the guys would walk by and someone said something to the effect of something about wheat thins. And the fridge says, oh, we don't have any wheat thins. Would you like to add those to your shopping list? Um, they say sure. So that's one of the main purposes of Internet Things is to have a device that can leverage some sort of data with the consumer and use it in some way. So in my case with these fare boxes and point of sale systems, they were taking the rider data and sending it back up to the cloud um, so that the user could then see their history, see their activity, and have some more up-to-date information in a user portal. Um, so with Internet of Things, the devices are connected to some sort of larger network. And they communicate with the cloud. That communication goes back and forth um, for this more up-to-date data and also to leverage that data. So some examples, I mentioned the smart fridge. Another example that has a lot of use today um, is Fitbit. If you think about wearing a Fitbit, uh, it keeps track of all your steps, and then it sends that up to some sort of larger system, um, and then you can view that in your mobile application. So it's a good example of sensors, and so it's sensing that you're walking. So lesson one, start small. Um, starting small is something that makes sense to do when developing pretty much any enterprise application. But I found it to be particularly true with working with devices and Internet of Things. Um, devices in general, or at least the ones that I was working with, were a lot more difficult to have their software updated. So it was really important to make sure that whatever we did was right to begin with. And that's easier to do if you're starting small. So how do you start small? First, get your devices connected to the network. So that way they can be internet of things and you ensure that that communication is back and forth immediately. Um, don't rush. So start with just some sort of simple mock service 
where your device can say, um, hello world, and that type of thing back and forth to the cloud, and you can log in for that that's there. Um, if you don't have proper direction, start and to plan for that growth and change. Um, Agile is you know, a form of development that's very popular right now to do that iterative development, so definitely plan for that. You're going to have change. You're going to have growth. Um, but essentially, just try and do the right thing first. Use the old adage, measure twice, cut once. Um, so try not to add the complexity right away. Um, with the starting small, you can plan for that growth and that flexibility. Um, choose the right tooling. I mention this because recently I've been on an engagement where we initially were using GitHub and Git, and then the client needed us to move over to RTC, which was a very painful transition. If you're familiar with RTC, it's painful. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, so if you can choose the right tooling to begin with, then that will help with ensuring that your development goes more smoothly overall. So some other benefits that you get from this starting small. Um, testing and error handling. So a lot of times these are things that get skipped at the beginning, but if you're starting small with your actual implementation, then maybe you have more time to do that testing and error handling. Um, I found this to be particularly true with devices, just because, as I mentioned, the devices we were working with could only be changed like every six months their software could get updated. It wasn't something you could do on a very quick basis, so being able to the testing, especially set up right away, allowed for us to ensure that any development done on the software side, we could ensure that that was good and consistent um, throughout our development process. So error handling, that's another thing, as I said, they get skipped a lot. And with that exception handling, you can decide if the device is going to handle it, if the application is going to handle it. Um, and it allows you to see what errors are going to happen, um, even at that small level. So that way you can see, okay, this specific exception might come up. Here's how we might want to handle it versus when, you know, you have all this development done and something comes up, you might have to search to figure out where it's coming from. So if you can know those things at the base level, uh, it'll help with the rest of the development. So security, I mentioned getting the devices connected with some sort of mock service right away. Um, but security, doing that right away is just as important. Um, particularly with devices, you want to ensure that you're not getting any bad information and that you can trust whatever it is sending you. Yeah. So ensure that that's done before you move on. That's one thing that gets skipped a lot. And when I was doing the development with this, these fair boxes and point of sales, it was completely skipped to begin with. Um, <laughs> so having to be able to just call a plain rest endpoint to having to actually secure them was a very different situation and required a decent amount of refactor versus had it just been done in the beginning when we had a mock service. So it would have been really simple to set up. So ensure that you get that set up before you move on. Um, class loading. I mentioned this because we were using um, an OSGI uh, platform with JBoss views, if anyone's familiar with that. So OSGI is very good at showing you class loading issues, but if you try and start too big, you will run into a lot of them and not know exactly what's going on, especially for people that are new with it. So starting small tends to prevent that. Um, with JE, you can also run into some of the same issues. They just might be a little bit more hidden because Maven might be picking and choosing what versions you're using um, through those dependency chains. So if you start small, you can ensure that you're using the right versions and everything to begin with. Um, PCI compliance. This is something that has come up at multiple clients of mine. Anytime you have credit cards involved, something to consider. So. Um, something to think about when you're starting small is personal information, and that kind of goes back into the security aspect and ensuring that everything that you're storing is secure to the point that it needs to be, 
and that you know any transmissions are secret to the point that they need to be. So check those informations, um, and you'll have the time and bandwidth to do that when you're starting small that you might not otherwise have. So some benefits of starting small. I've touched on these a little bit, but this should hopefully give a good overview. So you get a strong foundation. I mentioned those known errors that maybe you'll see from starting small. So it gives you a strong foundation that once you have all of that figured out and you know, okay, this communication with these devices goes back and forth and does well doing that, you can know that any issues you run into aren't in that layer. Useful documentation. So another thing with starting small, along with the testing and error handling, is you'll have the time to document. So with that, things become more maintainable. If you have people roll off the project, roll onto the project, they'll be able to ramp up quicker because of that documentation. Um, that's de definitely something that I see get postponed until the very end of projects a lot of the time. So quality code reviews. Um, no one likes doing code reviews that are 10,000 lines of code. So if you start off with a code review that is massive, people are less likely to thoroughly review it. If you start off with something small, then they'll have the time to actually go through and do that. So you're setting up this pattern of good development, essentially. Um, and then you can ensure that you have a high degree of maintainability throughout the project. So that'll be true with your development on the devices, development on the software, all across your project development. So security shortcuts. This is one of the areas I mentioned that we had not really implemented before with the devices, and then it led to a lot of refactor down the line. So avoiding things like hard coding passwords, even though it might <laughs> save some time, it's going to you know lead to more work overall later to adjust those things. Um, think about encrypting data that needs to be secure, try and do those things in your foundational level so you don't have to worry about them down the line. It's going to be much simpler. So lesson two is to find what you can. This all goes into requirements. So as a consultant, I know that these requirements sometimes are easy to get and sometimes are difficult to get. Um, Agile can be great for that to try and get some iteration going of, okay, we have these requirements now, go with that until we have the rest of the requirements. Um, but getting what you can can definitely help to avoid any changes down the road that maybe could have been avoided. So where to start with those requirements? Device requirements. How often do the devices need to be connected to the system? Are they connected constantly? Are they in constant communication with the overall system? Find out that type of thing. If they do go offline, are they allowed to work offline? And so for example, our point of sale systems, they were allowed to work offline for an hour. And after that hour, if they weren't back online, they had to go out of service until they were online. Um, which was a lot to do with more some of that storage capability of the device. But sometimes there might be a requirement so that you don't end up with a mismatch between your devices and your cloud system. So how secure does the system need to be? We talked about security. So these kind of, this goes hand in hand with that first lesson with the security aspect. Find out how secure it needs to be. Um, sometimes patience enough for what you're doing. Sometimes you want everything to be encrypted and secure across the board. Um, so find out how secure things need to be. And also, very important, define an audience. So I mentioned Fitbit earlier. What would happen if they had never defined an audience? They probably wouldn't have a device. Because they said, OK, we're going to make this bracelet type thing so that people can keep track of their steps and get more in shape. Um, smart appliances, like I have a Nest at home. Clearly, the Nest was made for people that are homeowners. If they designed it for people that had a camper or were renting, it probably wouldn't have been as popular. Um, 
So with the public transit system, one thing we didn't know up front was how secure the devices need to be, which is one of the things that led to it being implemented initially without that security. So if you can find out those things up front, then you can avoid a lot of those issues down the line. So other things to consider, who is going to manage what? So with um, devices, there's got to be some setup. So thinking about, okay, who's in charge of how this device is going to be set up, what software is going to be installed on it? Is that something managed by the cloud? Is that something managed by a person that they install it in person? Uh, where is that information stored? Those are all things to think about with the devices. Um, also, who handled errors? I'll talk more on this a little bit later about my opinion and lesson on handling errors, but determining um, who your client wants to handle those errors is important. Is it um, this application, that application, the device, the embedded software in the device, and who's going to hold that responsibility will depend on how you implement those error handling situations then. Um, versioning. Find out what versions of frameworks you can use. To find out what the device can support. So this also goes back a little bit to those class loading issues. Find out the versions first. You can avoid some of those class loading issues because you can make sure that the version thing is right to begin with. Um, one thing to avoid is not version your own code. Always version your code. It's going to change. Hopefully, over the course of time, the version of your code will change. Um, so try to get that implemented right away and define some sort of process as to how you're going to version it. Are there going to be snapshots, releases? Um, if you're going the version going to change every sprint? Get that process defined. So messaging requirements. Um, with talking about Internet of Things, typically a lot of messaging going on the communication between the device and the network. So some things to consider with messaging requirements is, does the order of your messages matter? Um, the order does matter. What happens if the messages come out of order? Is it something that can be handled and you can reorder them? Or does it cause the system to fail in some sort of way? The implications of each of these as well is just as important as thinking about if you want them. Um, do different types of messages have priority over others? So a client I'm at now, um, they have credit cards, and so there's lots of stolen, and then there's also switching from MasterCard to Visa. So if someone has a message going in to start off their card to be transferred from MasterCard to Visa, and then their card gets stolen, that transaction or message that says their card's stolen has a higher priority than the transfer because there's no point in transferring it since it's been lost completely different process anyways. So think about those things. Um, duplicates and zero loss are two very common requirements. Um, so think about what happens if there is a duplicate. If you're having messages just for some sort of logging, then a duplicate, it might look funny, but it's really not going to have high impact on the system. Versus if you're doing messaging with some sort of money transaction, like with a transit system, you have a balance on your card that's going to have pretty high impact. It's going to influence someone's balance on their card. Um, zero loss as well. Someone, if you lose a message and someone had added money, then maybe the money doesn't show up on their card. So that would have pretty high impact. Um, bad messages goes back a little bit to the who handles what situation. Device sends a bad message to the cloud. Does the cloud need to handle it or put it in some sort of folder and someone manually goes and changes it or does it get rejected and then someone has to change out the device. Figuring out that type of thing first with your messaging requirements. Um, some of these things you might not have an answer to right away, um, but definitely keeping in mind and keeping in mind the impact they have on your system will influence um, the next lesson a little bit and how you're picking your frameworks. Um, one situation where we didn't get requirements that caused issues was the situation of negative account balances. So these are some current styles of 
or you might slide or tap a car to get on a train or bus. In this case, probably a train. And so what we didn't define was what happens if cents is 50 cents and the ride costs a dollar. Is my card allowed to go to negative 50 cents? Is it um, going to get rejected? What happens? So um, in our case, luckily, the fare box just ended up throwing in exceptions, and then we were able to see it. But had we not defined it, we didn't even know what to expect in that situation. So then if you define it, you can adjust to say, OK, you're allowed to go negative up to you know $2 negative. Or you can just say, sorry, the card needs to be rejected. But in our situation, it didn't do either. It just threw an error and didn't give a real response to the user. Um, so another example um, with credit cards. So I mentioned that a little bit with priority. But another situation that wasn't defined was um, something with reoccurring transactions. So some cards were allowed to have reoccurring transactions. Some weren't. Um, like say Amex wasn't allowed to have reoccurring transactions. So getting it defined up front was important because we had a process for if your balance falls below whatever threshold you set, say $10, then it would auto reload your card. So finding out requirements for different credit cards um, or various payment information is important to begin with. If they can happen. Um, I mentioned PCI compliance, what information can be stored and how. Um, and once again, if you don't know something yet, definitely like people write it down and then try and figure that out throughout your sprints or whatever type of development process that you're doing. Um, so the next lesson is check capabilities. So this is checking capabilities of your device as well as whatever frameworks you are using. So I mentioned some of those messaging requirements might influence how you decide to choose your frameworks. Um, we'll talk a little bit about device capabilities first. So check if your devices can connect to the internet, since that is one thing that is very important if you're modeling them as IoT devices. If they can connect, is it wireless, wired? Can they connect to a mobile network? That type of stuff. Um, with talking about messaging, um, rest or soap capability, you could also throw JMF capability in there. Check how they're going to be communicating, essentially. Um, our devices already had SOAP capability, but they were able to update to use REST capability as well. Um, however, they were unable to use a HTTPS <laughs> connection, so that was one issue to work through to ensure that it was secure without using that. Uh, so finding out those capabilities will influence the rest of your development with the requirements and everything else. Um, buttons and user use cases. I mention this just because um, if you have a fare box or something, it needs to have that sensor to read the card. It needs to have um, those components. Same thing if you need buttons for whatever use case you need. Um, so other things on the device I mentioned that our point of sales could only work offline for about an hour and that was mainly due to storage. So check what amount of storage your devices have so that if situations such as it going offline does occur then you know how long it can be offline and still do whatever functions it needs to do. Um, payload size. With messaging, you might have a threshold on how large of a payload your device handle, which may plug into CPU and memory. Maybe it can only process messages that are a few megs, and you're anticipating messages that are a gig. Then you're obviously going to have to do some development to get that size down. So finding those things out first. Um, what this is referring to whether a device, um, so there's only one point of sale at a Walgreens, um, and five miles away there's another device at a Walgreens, and so on, versus if you have multiple in one location. So that kind of plays into the internet connectivity and 
what happens if a network goes down? You're going to lose more devices if they're in one place. And if you know that, then maybe you put in some sort of backup for various networks so that if this network goes down, another network is still available for those devices. Versus if you're just losing one device, it might not be as critical. Framework capabilities. Um, this is an area that we definitely had some learning. Um, we were using the integration from our camel, if anyone is familiar with that. It's implementation of enterprise integration patterns and it has some loading. You can do REST. Um, there's tons of components that can work with camel, but our team at the time was new to it. So some basic things like base64 encoding and decoding, we had used a different Java library and processor to do that, but Camel has it built in. So we ended up wasting this time implementing things uh, in the code that we already had a framework that did it for us. Um, it could also be true for XML, JSON. Um, so check that with frameworks both in the cloud application and also whatever's running on your device. So it'll increase your maintainability and you know, avoid that duplicate work. Um, security and error handling. A lot of times frameworks will have built-in components for that as well. Uh, so make sure you check for those things. Um, check exact version. So with REST, for example, with Camel, there's various different implementations and components you can use with that. Um, so you're trying to avoid the situation where you get really excited about a particular component and then realize that whatever version you're using that is you know, decided to be the supported version um, of that framework doesn't have it. So make sure you check the specific version to ensure that whatever capability you're interested in does exist there. So messaging options and capabilities to check for. Um, persistence. What happens if you have a keyword topic uh, with your message, and then the server goes down. Do you get that message back, or um, is it lost? Checking that capability in whatever type of messaging framework you're using uh, avoid a lot of issues down the road. Same with durable subscriptions. So what happens if you have a queue subscribe to a topic and it disconnects for some reason? And reconnects, is it going to get any messages that were in that topic beforehand? Or are those messages lost, just lost for that queue? Uh, priority queue. So I mentioned checking priority with messaging. So do you, does your framework actually support that? So check those things first. Um, the framework or messaging implementation that we ended up using, um, we realized not initially, but during development, that it didn't support durable subscriptions, didn't support priority queues, and by default, um, only had one consumer on the queue. So we could have avoided a lot of these issues had we just looked at those capabilities of that messaging framework to begin with and maybe gone with a different one that supported more of the uh, components that we really needed. Uh, another issue to check with messaging framework specifically is whether it's a once and only once delivery or once and more. Um, once more delivery is actually more common than I would have thought. Um, but it means that you have to handle duplicates, not just from the sending messages in and vice versa, but also from duplicates coming from your actual queue topic. So that can cause definitely some more issues than if you were planning for duplicates from the device that might be a few seconds apart versus coming from your queue where they might come in at the same exact time. So multiple consumers. Um, I mentioned that our framework to begin with that we were using by default was using a single consumer. So one issue that we ran into with this was that in our error handling, um, basically if a message came in too early for one reason or another before another message that we needed to know that information first. Um, like if someone had bought a card and then went and rode the bus right away. If we got the message that they rode the bus but didn't know they had bought a card, we would try and just wait to process that message later as the simplest uh, way to handle that situation that the client requested. 
So at that time, though, we decided to wait 10 minutes and then retry up to three retries. But with a single consumer, that consumer was then blocked for that 30 minutes that it was retrying. So then the queue was getting all clogged up with hundreds of messages that easily could have been processed during that time. Um, so just to get down multiple consumers worked easily enough. Um, but think about those things beforehand and whether you need parallel processing, whether you need multiple consumers, um, and the impact that multiple consumers might have on order um, or priority. Just thinking about those things first. Um, size limitations. Our messaging framework we found out did also have a size limitation. Um, so we knew that up front, but we also thought that the payload sizes we were working with were going to be small enough that it would not matter. So if it does have some sort of size limitation, just make sure you handle it in some way, even if you don't know what's going to happen. So one good example of device capabilities that I came across is the fare boxes that we were using um, had a time set on them. And when daylight savings rolled around, our team had assumed that the time would change automatically just the way it does on your cell phone. Um, that was not the case. And we found that these fare boxes had to have their time manually changed to year during these daylight savings times. So before that was done, um, messages were coming in and because of the time, and um, our time zones were defined with GMT, so it looked like it was a different time zone than what the cloud was using, um, which resulted in a lot of weird time calculations that could have been avoided. So um, using something standard for time zones like GMT can help that a little bit. Um, but checking things that maybe might be considered little quirks of a device and finding those out first can avoid some of these issues. So backup cameras. Um, so this is not related to the box, obviously. Um, but one example of checking device capabilities that I think is a great one is backup cameras. If you were developing a uh, software for backup cameras to show this output and you developed a camera, but then you had a pretty old like 99 car that didn't have a place to mount it um, or you couldn't install the software then there'd be no point so making sure that whatever software you're going to have actually work with whatever device you have applications similarly um, smartphones are being updated pretty often these days um, one of the newer things is fingerprint scanning so if you're developing an app that has fingerprint scanning, you want to make sure that whatever your target audience is will be using phones that have a fingerprint scan. Otherwise, you will miss your target audience and your devices won't have the capabilities that they need. So the last lesson is trust your device. Um, I talked about security and the importance of that. Without security, you might not want to trust your device because you don't know exactly what is coming from it. So um, but trusting your device is pretty essential. If you aren't going to trust it, why are you connecting it to your larger system? Uh, so in order to trust that device, you're going to need that security. Um, so that goes back to starting small. It goes back to checking capabilities. Um, basically, it all stems from the other lessons. Uh, so with that security, ensure that it's secure enough that you're going to be able to take what the device does and it and go from there and use that information to build a better system. Um, when you're trusting the device, we talked about who's going to handle exceptions. Um, I definitely take the position of minimal error handling responsibility on your device. If you think about who's going to be using these devices, they often aren't going to be the most technical people. If I had to troubleshoot a Fitbit, but I probably wouldn't know exactly what to do other than maybe turning it off and on. Um, and for anyone that's worked in some sort of tech support, you know how many calls come in where that's the only thing someone needs to do and they still haven't done it. Um, so assume that your users are non-technical and the device should have minimal error handling responsibility. Um, if you put the responsibility on the device, then you need to make sure that um, 
it can do retries, it can do software updates frequently, all these things that probably are a little more difficult devices than software on some sort of cloud. Um, so trusting the device, one thing that can help with this and help with any oh, um, differentiation would be uh, some sort of check-in requirement. So with our system, the device configuration was actually managed by a cloud uh, website that users could log into and say, okay, we're going to sell these passes at this price, and the fare box will deduct this much money for one tap, and you know, if they tap within the next hour, this much money, those types of configurations. Um, but in order to ensure that that configuration on the cloud and the device match, there needed to be some sort of check-in requirement that there was a max length of time that they might not match. Um, so we implemented that it needed to check for um, configuration changes every 10 minutes. Um, sooner you could have it push the device. Um, for our particular use case with the devices, it made more sense to have the device make the request than to try and push it to them. Um, backwards compatibility with devices. Again, this is something that tends to be a little bit more important depending on how often you are allowed to service the devices, update the software, etc. cetera. Um, you want to ensure that you can accept and process messages from the device that might have an updated software version that the cloud software hasn't updated and vice versa because it's more likely to happen than if you have just a cloud system you can update that all at once typically um, with the devices since you might have to service them it's more likely to be on a sort of rolling basis so no error in the final result one of the situations that we had to decide if we were going to trust the device or not um, was with tapping a card and some of those out of order messages. So we decided that our messages could come in out of order for ridership. So imagine that my pass had $20 on it and I went and I tapped it, took a dollar off her bus, my balance is now $19. I go and do that again to come home the same day, my balance is now 18 So what if the message that says my balance is 18 gets to the cloud first. Um, so if the cloud were to say, okay, this message shows the initial balance is 19, the final balance is 18, it's going to say, wait, I have an initial balance of 20. So if it were to do math, that's why I say avoid math, it would say, okay, 20 minus 1 is 19, your balance is now 19. And then it would get the second message later and say, well, this message, this transaction happened first, so I'm not going to do any math for that. So it's showing your balance is 19 instead of the 18 that it should be. So if you did math the whole time, you might be okay. But then what if the second message never came in? What if you lost a message? Um, or just if you just trust the device and say, okay, this is the fair box that balance is now 18. And that was at this time. We are going to trust that. And then if we get a different balance at a different time, then we will take that that if that is more up to date. So it tended to be a safer approach than trying to do that math, um, which maybe you're able to get all your messages in order and no duplicates and no loss, um, which if you can, great. But it seems a little less likely. Um, so just try and trust what the device is sending um, if there is ever any mismatches. So in relation to this, um, if I am using the Starbucks app, then maybe uh, my balance is showing as one thing on my phone, another thing on the website. Um, I should be able to trust what's on my phone because this is what I literally scanned to get my drink most recently. Um, maybe it hasn't updated the cloud completely yet for my overall account. Um, customer can't do that and they show a $15 balance on their app and a $20 balance online and then they call up Starbucks, they're going to be confused and want some sort of explanation. Um, 
So they should be able to trust the app and ensure that that's the source of truth. Um, and if they can't, there's going to be a lot of confusion. Um, I mentioned Fitbit once again. It's a really good IoT example. Um, so what would be the point in someone buying this sort of device if they weren't going to trust that it was keeping track at least relatively accurately, how far they're walking every day, how many steps they're taking. Um, so consumers should be able to trust it and typically won't even purchase something like that if they won't be able to trust it. Um, we all talk about uh, and use GPSs. It's pretty common nowadays. And we wouldn't continue using them if they didn't take us to the right place the majority of the time, if we didn't trust them to do that. Um, obviously, most of us have probably had a situation where we end up on some dirt road that doesn't lead to anywhere because of a GPS, but in general, we trust it. Um, farming innovation. So this is an interesting example of trusting the device and being able to use that information to better some sort of application. So before I would tractors would go and made plant their seeds, um, and then they'd get harvested. But once Internet Things started to come into play, they were able to use GPSs and other um, Internet Things technologies to keep track of exactly where they were planting, um, and then use that data to then make plans to plant and harvest more efficiently. That's been able to lower costs and has led to more abundant crops um, and really has led to a lot of farming. So if they hadn't trusted the information that was being gathered by these devices, that innovation would have never happened. Tesla is another one that has definitely blown up. Sorry. Has definitely blown up the T uh, sector recently. Um, if you think about autopilot and the self-driving car, one of the best ways that it learns and works is by gathering that information and then using it to make that function better. Um, I don't know that we're at the point where most of us would completely trust a self-driving car, but the application and the cloud system for Tesla is trusting that information to use it to improve. Um, so you want to keep an eye out for you know some sort of fluke messages that may seem a little weird. Um, maybe flag them, not have someone go check and something seems off that you might not want to trust. But in general, you want to be able to trust your devices to use the information to lead to that innovation, lead to that uh, better applications. So hopefully these lessons have been useful and can help you avoid some of the issues that I ran into on my first IoT uh, long-term project. And we have plenty of time for questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. or the app can work offline to be able to do that update and then send it back up when it gets that connectivity. Um, but I also suggest, you know, if it can't do that, maybe some sort of message to say, hey, you're offline. Things might be out of date until you're back online. Um, you know, pop-ups. Because you're right, that's something that is going to happen. Um, so, I, I mean, ideally, you want stuff to be able to work offline at least a little bit. Yeah, 
Um, so we actually had a UUID. So <laughs> that was the main way. Um, before we had that implemented, it was which is one of the reasons that led to the UUID. Um, was there was timestamp comparison and you know the account ID plus the timestamp plus the device that it was used at basically something that in theory should be unique but with time zones and things like that um, I try to avoid comparing time at any point just because there seems to be so many issues with that and you have to make sure that um, if you are comparing time that the time on the cloud system matches the time on the fare box, matches the time on the phone if they're using that, um, and that everything is consistent and that you're comparing accurately. So yeah, the UID was the best solution that we found. Um, no, actually. It was an interesting system. And the most blessed, I wouldn't say. Um, obviously, there were a lot of lessons learned from there. Um, so we were just going with basic off because they couldn't support us as well with the devices. So we pushed for it and were told basically, sorry, right, these devices aren't going to be able to update over two and a half years even to use them. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably could have happened if they had started it from the beginning, but it definitely showed how out of date some of the software they were using was. I would say that definitely would have been more ideal. <laughs> yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So they had to go. Um, Right, so that's why we implemented the uh, check-in requirement or attendance for the um, configuration because they could be offline. Um, you got a fare box that's on a bus and it's traveling around the city. So that was allowed to be offline for, I think it was three days before it had to check in. Yeah, versus the point of sales had that check-in requirement. So the point of sales was pretty consistently online and they were only allowed to be offline for an hour or so. Um, which mostly was because of storage constraints um, and ensuring that that data of people buying packages was really up to date. But as far as ridership, it definitely, there was a three day window of which stuff could still come in with. Um, so someone would take that in the field, take it offline, um, the data would be probed off of it, and then they would have to, um, probably in the web UI mark that device is out of service, and then put in a new one. Um, I mean, there was definitely monitoring in place if it started sending up some sort of junk that good messages um, but if it just say was broken and was still technically functioning properly someone probably wouldn't know until someone physically saw that and you know removed it or turned it off <laughs> there was a, there was some on the point of sale devices I know that the fare boxes probably not
yeah, so our our primary development was definitely more the cloud application and the integration with the devices. And then the client had their own Fairbox team, which um, they had been working with the Fairbox team, you know, forever and ever. And then there was another team brought in for the point of sale devices development. So the point of sale device development had been done maybe five years ago, but was at least relatively recent. Um, and they were able to update most of it. But then the fare boxes were pretty out of date. So the key, um, the client was more concerned about the website looking pretty, you know, functioning properly, which. <laughs> so, yeah, because I worked mainly on the integration between the two. So they had to go and request a token with, you know, one set of credentials, get that back, and then use that to request other things. And we were using Amazon too, for some of that um, they could go and request access to an Amazon resource. So then they had to request the Amazon token from our system, we'd give it to them, and then they would, I think it was just basically people encoded that plus some other keys to get the Amazon resource. There's any more questions, I'll be around a bit. So, good to go.